Sweet little Jesus boy, they made you be born in a manger. Sweet little holy child, didn't know who you were. You know you've come to save us, Lord, to take our sins away. Our eyes was blind and we could not see. Sweet 
<laughs> Little Jesus boy, born long time ago. And we didn't know who you were, Lord, we didn't know who you Well, good evening and welcome to our annual Christmas Eve service. I'm thankful that uh, your schedule allowed you to be able to come and to spend this time with us as we put a cap on the Christmas season. I'd like to read a passage to you from, um, from Galatians. I think the Apostle Paul can help us in making sure that we have the right perspective on this season. Galatians 3, starting in verse 23, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for the great work that You have done in sending Your Son Sending your son not only to be born, but to live and to die on our behalf. That you raised him, and he's now seating, seated at the right hand of you and is interceding for us even now. And Lord, we thank you that one day he will return to bring those who are his to himself. And we, Lord, we pray that they would be many. I pray, Father, that as we have our service here, that while it is a great tradition, and may bring back a ton of nostalgia. I pray, Father, that we would find a, a renewal of our hearts and minds to where we see the glory and the wonder and the beauty of this newborn King, Jesus. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. Why don't we stand and worship?
We read in Luke 2, 8 through 14, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And stay seated for this first song, and then if you'll stand up for the second one. Loving God and love divine, star and angels gave the sign. Bow to babe on bend The Savior of humanity Unto us a child is born He shall reign forevermore
the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, beginning at the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, since he was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had thought this over, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. As our brother Wynn read from Matthew chapter 1, If you have a copy of the scriptures, I'd invite you to meet me at Matthew chapter number 2. And it's here that we're about 18 months after what when just read. And I want to read, at this point, verses 1 to 6. And it says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it arose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means among the least of the rulers of Judah, for you shall come, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. We'll look at a little more, but just a couple of things here. I'm, I'm amazed at how Christ was worth the risk for the Magi. Think about this. The Magi, we we really first hear about them in the book of Daniel. When when the people of Israel, about 600 years, five, 600 years before the time of Christ, the people of Israel were taken into exile. They had been warned by God, if you don't follow what I'm, just some of these basic things that I'm saying to you, then you'll be removed from your land, you'll be removed from your place of worship, and I will send you far away. And he sent them to at the time, Babylon, and then while they were in Babylon, there was a skirmish, and then Persia took over. And so, Daniel had risen up the ranks, even though he was of the people of Israel, he had risen up the ranks. And by then, he had overseen all of the seers, because whenever they needed someone to decipher a dream, none of those fellows could do it, they'd always call Daniel. And Daniel would come in and help them understand what was going on. But in the midst of that, Daniel loved the Lord. And the, peop- the things of God were not restricted to a little piece of land in the Middle East. And God was there in the midst of them. And so he began to tell them about one, that how they were descended from another guy that we hear in the book of Numbers by the name of Balaam. And Balaam had a prophecy that came through him from Numbers 24, 17, I see him but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. This was 1,400 years before the Magi show up. And when they're in Daniel, this is 500 years before the Magi show up. And so they're thinking about this, and they're remembering these promises. 
And suddenly one day they see the star arise. When it talks about a star arises in the east, it was actually they were in the east. The star was west. Otherwise, they'd have been in India or China somewhere. They went west. Now, we think about this and we think, okay, the Magi. So they were in Persia. That's modern-day Iran. And we got the Fertile Crescent to work with. They were about 800 to 900 miles away. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have any of the modes of transportation that we take care of, that we, that we are used to. They didn't, they didn't call a Lyft or an Uber. They, they, had to, they had to foot it. They had to go on foot. And another thing here is that sometimes I think we think because there was gold, frankincense, and myrrh that there were only three kings. I really don't think Herod would have been troubled by three guys showing up from a long way away. I think it was an envoy. I think there was a lot of people that were with them having, having three gifts, but I think there's a lot of people that were with them. I know it says we three kings of Orient are. I get it. We'll say we three plus kings of Orient are. There were more than three, but, we, but it'll still keep within the meter and the, the rhythm and the pattern and such. But think about that. They were willing to go eight, 900 miles to encounter their, their king their king that had been passed down, this promises that had been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. Are we willing to take that risk? It's a big risk following Jesus. I, I'm telling you this, I, I, and it's, it's no, it, it, especially when you may have grown up and you may have been in a country where following Jesus, you know, it, 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 was, it was culturally accepted. And we have to get over the fact for some of us that that's not the way it is now. But I don't necessarily, it's a bad thing that the culture doesn't accept them. But I want to make sure that they're accepting the real one. Not the diluted, watered down political version sometimes that we present to people. We need to present the real thing. We need to present the real Jesus. And so when he shows up, you, you see here, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it arose, and we have come to worship him. Now, again, Herod, the king, heard this. He was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, why was all Jerusalem with him? Well, if you know anything about Herod, you look him up, you find a couple of things. One, he was a very depressed fellow. He came from a, it, there, there was a I think it was a genetic thing. There, he was very depressed, and he was also extremely paranoid. You add those two, two things together, that is a relational dynamite. It, it really is. And it brings a lot of insecurity. And when you have power, you think about over all the leaders over time, when they've risen to power and they've been paranoid and they've been depressed and they've been insecure, and all of a sudden there's no restraint on them, they begin to really act out in ways that, are, that, that we read about as warnings in history books 50 years later, 60, 70, 80 years later. So they were troubled because, oh no, we don't want a mad Herod. Because we, what we're going to see later on, if you read through this, um, Herod, because the wise men ended up getting away from him, he ended up going and doing what Pharaoh did back in Exodus 2. And he killed all the young men, two years old and younger, because he wanted to eliminate the threat. So this is Herod. And so Herod, no, but, but Herod's, Herod's feisty, right? Herod's crafty. He, he's politically savvy. He knows what to do. And so what does he do? So th this is something that's reminding him of prophecies that are from the Old Testament. Oh, okay, I'm going to go to the chief priests and the scribes, and we're going to find out, okay, what do they know? And so he goes, and it says, so he said, when he went there in verse 4, assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. What did they say? Did they say, I don't know. Maybe. They didn't say that. Not only did they not say that, they went to the book of Micah. Do you know where Micah is? A lot of us may not. I was honest, we have to find, if we have a brand new Bible, the pages will stick together. We'll go right past it. That's Micah. And it's in Micah 5 and verse 2. Or, and, and, and so they're quoting him chapter and verse. So think about this. There's these, this envoy that arrives in Jerusalem and asks about the new king. And what does he end up, they, and asks about the new king, Herod gets a little bit troubled. They go to a prophecy about this new king. 
So they had all the information there, and that may be where you are. You have all the information. You know where to find stuff. You might answer a couple of questions on Bible trivia really, really easily. You have the information, but you're not willing to take the risk. It would have been a risk for the chief priests and the scribes to say, I'm going to follow Jesus. It, it would have been a risk for Herod to lay down his crown and say, I'm not the true king. He is. And so there's always this kingship, this who's going to be in charge of me that is fighting in us, still is. The wise men came and, were, and was willing to take the risk. They could, probably couldn't figure out why everybody else, if they knew, where the, knew the prophecies and knew all that, they probably couldn't figure out why they weren't following him either. But they weren't, but they weren't going to make that mistake. And so you go to verse 7 where it talks about this. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them the time that the star had appeared. Because it took a while. Eight, remember 800, 900 miles? It took a while. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go search diligently for the child when you have found him and bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Do you think he was really wanting to worship him? Of course not. He was wanting to eliminate him. He was a threat. He wasn't, this wasn't a joy. Jesus is a threat. And Jesus may be a threat for you if you're honest. Because if you, if you turn your life over to him, then maybe some of the things that you're saying is, is, is a problem in life or a problem with culture or a problem with this and all that, suddenly you won't have any more excuses. Because Jesus, you know, has taken care of the issues of this world. You're saying, well, the issues are still here. And some of you may be sitting there thinking, boy, if I could just change this part of my life, then I'll believe him. If I could just change, or if I could be like this person, if I could be like this person. We're always looking to see if we could be like somebody else. I want to remind you of what Don Whitney said a long time ago. Don Whitney said, there is a hurt in every heart. You, you're, you may be looking at somebody and say, well, I wish I could be like them. Guarantee you they got something going on too. And if they don't, the day's still young. The week's still young. The year's still young. It's coming. It, it, it is. And so Jesus has come, maybe not to remove the storm, but to give us an anchor in it. And so when you look at this, he goes on, verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Rejoicing with great joy, right? That's, that's just the way, it's an idiom that they used in that culture to joy upon joy upon joy upon, it was stacked. Stacked joy. Over and over abundantly, they couldn't, that's the only way that they could describe it. And when going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and what? Isn't he cute? No, they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But God was going to take care of them because Herod was counting on them to come back and tell him the whereabouts of this newborn king but the dreams God lets us know what's next God lets us know what to do if we're listening and he did that here and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod they departed to their own country by another way I encourage you to read on it's a horrifying detail as I mentioned earlier because when Herod found out that he was tricked Suddenly, his niceness just went out the window, and you see that he begins to pull another Pharaoh, Pharaoh point two, and he begins to wipe out all of the young men, two years of age and younger, in order to try to eliminate the threat. You say, how terrible Herod could do that, but think about this for us. When we come to the word and we encounter the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, does it bring us joy upon joy upon joy upon joy? Or is it really a threat? Because we want to be king. We want to be the, the ruling magnate. We want to be in charge. And we don't want anybody really telling us what to do. Or maybe we just tune out. Maybe we just say, this doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't believe any of this. And 
then we move on? Or does the joy hit you? Let me ask you this. When you hear the Word of God, does it trouble you in a bad way or in a good way? How does it trouble you in a, in a bad way? Well, because again, when you're co- approaching what God is saying about some things, and you may encounter some things that may need to change according to what He's called you to do, and that troubles you in a bad way. But there's also a way where you can be troubled in a good way. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says that godly sorrow brings repentance, but worldly sorrow brings death. See, there's things in this world that are just going to make you sad, make you sad and not be able to understand it. And if you, if you lean into that, then you may end up trying to do some things that are going to be detrimental not only to you, but to the people that are around you. But if you recognize that, worldly, that godly sorrow, that when God brings something to your mind that's not what he would have it to be, and then he, he is bringing you to the place where you should be, it's going to be hard in the meantime, just like when you're having surgery or you're, having, you're going to the doctor and they're telling you to do some things. You know, you've got to do the physical therapy. You've got to do that. You've got to do the exercises. But it hurts. It's hard. I don't like it. It makes me cry. I get it. But you still have to do the work because when you do the work, then it'll be better for you on the other side. And that's what God's doing in you. God is working in you to bring you to where he needs you to be. Why? Because he loves you. But what are people going to say? What are people going to think? What are my teachers going to say? What are my, what's my husband or wife going to say? What's my parents going to say? They raised me a certain way, and if I end up going this way, then that's going to be tough. He's worth the risk. He was worth the risk for the Magi. He's been worth the risk for the martyrs and, and the people of faith all along, and he's worth the risk 2023 going into 2024. But you've got to come to him on his terms. And his terms are good terms, but they're still his terms. So, we're getting ready to have the candles. For those of you that were expecting true candlelight, I am terribly sorry. However, you will notice on the side that they did actually work in uh, the, the fake wax to be able to give you that feel of, uh, of, of actual wax there. No, we, we want to make sure because we want to make sure fire it's, have you noticed that what it is like when uh, James 3 talks about how the tongue is a fire? Have you noticed what, if there's a little spark that was put on the floor, well, that's a little drop of water. You put the drop of water on the floor of that property. What happens to that drop of water? Well, it just kind of stays there. You put a little spark on this carpet, it doesn't just stay there. So we want to make sure that we're providing a way for us to um, have the candlelight service without the, uh, the candlelight per se. But either way, whatever kind of light it is, any light can cut through any darkness. And especially the light of the world who's Jesus. He can cut through any darkness. Mm -hmm. And we want you to know that. The darkness in here, the darkness out there, the darkness, the darkness everywhere. It can cut through it all. And He will. So if you grab your candles, please. And whoever is in charge of the, um, the killing of said lights, whenever it is, uh... <laughs> hey, when it's time to cut out the lights, it's time to cut out the lights, everybody, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Fred, very much. So, uh, you know how to do this? Just keep twisting. Right before it breaks, there it is, and you see the light. There's something about this. There's something really um, tender about this. I'm so thankful that the light cuts through. What a great picture this is. Let's stand together and sing this so wonderful Christmas carol, Silent Night, Holy Night.
This world is broken, but we thank the Lord that He came to set it straight, in part now, but one day in fullness. He's going to make all things new. He's going to make all things right. In the meantime, hold on to the Jesus. In the meantime, hold on to the Jesus that is working in you and working in this world here and now. The light that God has given to you as a follower of Jesus, make sure that you pass that light on to others. Spread the seed of the gospel. Begin praying for those who don't know him. and You'll be shocked at what God will do in 2024. I wish you all, on behalf of ARBC, I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas Eve. you got a little bit of a white Christmas for you, so how wonderful is that? And I just pray that you take time tomorrow in the midst of opening presents and the fellowship and everything that you have to remember the birth of our Lord and Savior. You are dismissed. Thank you so much. we got a box for you to put these in. Um, so glad that you could come. Merry Christmas.